Good morning, everybody, and welcome to uh, a special presentation of Ask Dr. Doreen. I am Dr. Doreen Graham Pichet. I am a clinical psychologist and a board certified behavior analyst. And normally, I would be doing a show for you on Tuesdays with my friend and host, Shannon Penrod. Um, where I answer your questions. But today, I'm doing a special kind of presentation for you on the topic of anxiety, uh, especially anxiety in parents of children who have disabilities. So I hope that you'll uh, enjoy the talk, and I'm very excited to uh, talk to you about this subject because I think it's a very, very important subject for parents. And hopefully, uh, you know, I've never actually given this particular presentation. Hopefully, we will also have a lot of time to answer some questions online, okay? So, why don't we get started and um, talk a little bit about anxiety and exactly sort of what it is, right? Now, how many of you can say that you've never experienced anxiety? I would guess that's a very li limited, small number of people, right? Most of us have, in some way or, or another, experienced some level of anxiety throughout our lives. The issue is that sometimes these anxieties become, they come and go, and that's a very normal thing. But over time, sometimes when something is really, uh, you know, causing us fear and anxiety, it can also stay and become pretty prevalent. And then when it lasts for a long period of time, it actually starts to turn into like excessive worrying. And it becomes very, very difficult for us to, uh, you know, put those worries aside and get on with our day-to-day -day lives. So these thoughts and anxieties and fears become part of our life and actually start to become so debilitating that now we have what is considered an actual disorder, right? Because it has now started to interfere with day-to-day -day life. And when we're in that state, uh, you know, it becomes almost very impossible or it feels impossible to, to get control of it. And it feels like our minds are just uh, going in circles and as a result we start to even, I think, avoid situations that we think might trigger further anxiety. And so over time, anxiety can often lead to isolation, which is also kind of, uh, you know, resembles depression. Anxiety and depression actually are like two sides of the same coin in some ways. And a, a lot of people who experience anxiety for lengthy periods of time um, are not only mentally, but also physiologically kind of burnt out. And sooner or later, it turns into pretty severe depression. So it's even, you know, when you start to experience anxiety, it's like a very, very important phase because that is the phase that you can actually start to pay attention and try to do things that are going to change your anxiety and turn things around before it becomes so debilitating that it starts to affect your day-to-day -day life. When you start to, uh, when you, if you don't deal with the anxiety and it goes on for some period of time, uh, don't be surprised if you start to feel physical symptoms as well, right? So sometimes we will experience like increased heart rate, like your pulse is going fast, your heart is going fast, or even restlessness, or uh, a lot of people report that anxiety will cause them to have difficulty concentrating, right? And of course, the most important one, I think, which affects a lot of other uh, physiological symptoms is sleep. Anxiety tends to interfere with sleep in a very, very disturbing way. And of course, when you don't have sleep, that leads to a lot of other issues and illnesses. So again, um, just trying to kind of uh, make sure that we're, we all agree, anxiety can come in a, in a very mild form at first, but it's important to pay attention to it and to try to do things that can help us overcome it. 
this is kind of the state when you know before when you when anxiety starts to turn into what we classify as a disorder it's when you've lived with this sort of heightened response state for for a little bit of time right and it becomes uh, so debilitating that it starts to cause psychosomatic illnesses those are illnesses that come about and they're very real physical illnesses but they are generated by something in your psyche it's your thinking and the way that you feel your body actually starts to feel illnesses that could have other otherwise been avoided. So fortunately, there is treatment for anxiety, and we're going to talk about some of the psychological treatments today. Um, there, you know, there's also medical treatments, and I'm, I'm going to just touch on that very briefly, and I, I'm a big, big supporter of both of these types of interventions because they function in different ways, and we'll talk about that. But let's start by just talking about you know, kind of what is anxiety and why does it even happen, right? And it's important to understand that anxiety itself is kind of an adaptive function, right? In other words, it is something that is beneficial to the human being. And we start to have, it's like an instinctual response that we start to have. And it comes from a protection of the body, right? It's your mind trying to figure out how, what you have to do to protect yourself. Okay, so when you st start to have anxiety, one of the very first things that happens is that you produce this, you activate your autonomic nervous system, actually the sympathetic portion, uh, portion of that, and you essentially start to have what we call the flight or fright response, flight or flight, fright or flight. Fright means obviously you are going to, you know, you're so afraid of something, you're gonna to try to fight back and protect yourself that way. And flight, of course, means that you're gonna run away, right? You're so afraid of something that you're gonna run away. And if you can think about it in any situation that is fearful uh, or fear evoking, uh, those are the two ways that you can protect yourself, right? You can either fight back or you can escape it. Right? So if you think of anxiety in that sense, it's something that's really kind of good for you. It protects you. The problem becomes when it starts to happen, that, that response of wanting to fight or flight starts to happen when there isn't a real uh, thing to be afraid of, right? Um, so for example, uh, let's say in the beginning, you feel like, okay, you're going to uh, protect your body. Your mind sees someone approaching you with, let's say, a, a weapon, right? And you have that response of fighting or running away. And that's a very adaptive, normal thing because, hey, if someone's going to approach you with a weapon, it's appropriate for you to either fight them back or to run away. The problem comes when that there, someone is approaching you, they don't have a weapon, but you're in your mind, it, that response of flight and fright has become so pervasive that even if someone is approaching you without a weapon, you feel like you gotta fight them or you gotta run away. And you become uh, reactive to situations even though they're not really situations that you need to be afraid of, right? You develop fears to things that are not even really there. And that is not, it's, you know, I, I want to talk about this a little bit because um, it's important to realize that this is not something that is a weakness. This is not something that is your fault. Um, this is really your mind working to protect you from a situation. And it's very typical for the mind to overgeneralize and to think of situations that are similar to the initial situation and then therefore try like overgeneralize and try to protect you or try to keep you away from anything that resembles the original harmful situation, okay? And so over the period of time, you start to experience anxiety in situations that are not even challenging. And that's just a, a typical pattern that happens. And, and I'm sure many of you, who, if you are experiencing anxiety, you, this might kind of sound familiar to you. It started 
started with something small, but now you wake up and it's almost like every day you have anxiety and there's actually nothing really happening anymore. You just have anxiety on an ongoing basis and we'll talk about that. Another really interesting thing that happens in the brain is that when you start to experience anxiety, the part of the brain that is kind of the judgment center, it's the part that controls our thinking and uh, make, helps us make good decisions. That's called the prefrontal cortex, which is right around here in your brain. That part of the brain actually becomes underactive. It starts to really become underactive, whereas at the same time, the portion of the brain that has to do with the fear response, the amygdala, becomes overactive. It's, it's very interesting. So, you know, initially you have this physiological response, but then in the future you're in a situation there's nothing that is going to evoke anxiety. There's no real stimulus that's going to evoke anxiety, but because you're conditioned, your brain actually starts to perform in a way where your prefrontal cortex is not functioning strongly. At that moment, your amygdala is taking over and, and producing that fear response, okay? So this is a very interesting aspect of anxiety and it's important because you come to realize that there is a physiological aspect to it. It's kind of like a circular thing. We should talk a little bit before I get into kind of the, the cognitive treatments, the way that you can help yourself get over anxiety. I just want to very quickly pause and talk about the diagnosis of anxiety because that's sort of important as well. And here we have the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual uh, of Disorders, of Mental Disorders, called the DSM-5. And many parents who follow my show, you'll know that, obviously, usually we're talking about the section that talks about autism. Um, but today we're going to talk about the entire chapter, which is anxiety. And it's interesting that anxiety, of course, is, is very broad. It affects people in different ways, and there's different types of anxiety. And I just want to very quickly kind of go through and talk to you briefly about some of these types. So to begin with, there's separation anxiety disorder, right? And this is generally what we, we see when there's recurrent excessive distress when anticipating or experiencing separation from home or major attachment figures. And this is something you see a lot in children. And uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail today about it, but it is one of the very significant anxiety disorders. And then we have, you know, selective mutism, which also happens quite a bit in children where it's a consistent failure to speak in specific situations where there's an expectation for speaking. And of obviously selective mutism is one of those things that happens sometimes when we're giving, doing public speaking. Uh, people just freeze. That's selective mutism. And a lot of children, believe it or not, um, won't speak and we, call, we just say, oh, they're shy. But it is just because of the anxiety that they're experiencing at that moment and they're thinking, oh, I'm going to fail. So that prevents them from actually talking. We have social anxiety disorder, which is a, a really important one. And the, the key characteristics of social anxiety disorder are a marked fear or anxiety about one or more social situations in which the individual is exposed to possible scrutiny by others, which is kind of interesting. Examples, of course, are things like having a conversation, meeting people that you don't know, um, or being observed in a, in a public setting or giving a speech, another example. So these are, this is uh, a disorder that a lot of adults come to me and they tell me that they're experiencing, you know, significant social anxiety. And often, honestly, people mistake this for a diagnosis of autism. And of course, social anxiety is not uh, as prevalent as autism. Autism affects a, a lot of different areas, but there is, uh, you know, it's, it's understandable that you would also have a certain level of social anxiety when you have the diagnosis of autism yourself as well. 
Moving on with, um, we also have panic disorder, which is part of the anxiety disorders. And I'll talk about panic a little bit. A lot of questions have come in about uh, people who experience panic. And it's, you know, panic is the most common physiological response when you have ongoing anxiety. Um, sooner or later, it will turn into panic disorder or panic attacks just because your body now has learned to have those physiological responses of heightened uh, heartbeat and you know all of those types of things for repeatedly. And so uh, lots of different things in the environment trigger uh, this panic response. And, and panic, you know, is differentiated with just generalized anxiety, which is the one that I'm going to talk about most, because there are physical signs of panic. When you have panic disorder, you have things like uh, palpitations and pounding heart and sweating and trembling and all these types of things that happen, which are very disturbing. All right. So, and then of course there's different levels of panic that we can experience as well. Another type of anxiety disorder that some people experience, and it's a pretty severe one, is agoraphobia. And agoraphobia is when you actually have developed anxiety towards social situations to such an extent that you are afraid of going out of your house and you remain in your home, you won't go outside, you're not going to use, you know, public transportation, go in open spaces, and you will just want it, not, you don't, you're afraid of crowds, afraid of people. A lot of people who are, have agoraphobia actually end up just remaining at home, and it becomes very isolating, and that is one of the anxiety disorders that commonly turns into depression, which then has its own a set of consequences, obviously. Okay, so finally we're on generalized anxiety disorder. And I want to just, you know, today we're going to talk about generalized anxiety disorder and some of those other ones as well. But generalized anxiety disorder is, is excessive anxiety and worry occurring more days than not over a period of about six months. Okay, and this worry or anxiety, generalized anxiety, can be about a number of different activities, events, um, they could be home related, work related, it doesn't matter. Um, but basically, the person experiencing this will feel like they cannot control uh, what's going on and they have, uh, you know, an ongoing uh, sense of anxiety and they can't really. Uh, pinpoint what is causing it um, or lots of different situations cause it and that's why we call it generalized because it feels like you know with a phobia for instance there's a specific object that evokes that uh, even with things like social anxiety we know that it is due to social situations etc but with generalized anxiety the fear that may have started with in one area has now expanded and over the course of time, you just, most of the time, you feel restless, you have heightened feelings of anxiety and fear. Uh, you don't, you just, you never feel quite comfortable in your skin, right? And, and that is, I think, a lot of what a lot of parents tell me they feel. And, uh, you know, it is, it's concerning because obviously, uh, when you feel that way, it starts to have physical uh, responses that can then be damaging lifelong, right? So now we can talk a little bit more about the things that we can do to try to help ourselves when we have these feelings of anxiety. First of all, the... the it, I want to start by saying that if you feel today when you're listening to this or at any time, if you feel that your anxiety is so strong that it is out of control and you are afraid and you just cannot function, if it's gotten to the point where it's, it's already at that point where it's really interfering with your life, I want you to get help immediately. You know, a lot of times, because anxiety comes on gradually and depression also, um, we tend to not get help 
when we should. We just wait. And it becomes so debilitating that we just give up. And, and I don't want you to do that. So take it seriously. Uh, don't dismiss your own feelings. Get help. And nowadays, fortunately, there it is easier than ever to get help because you can, uh, you know, go online and you can find a psychologist, you can find a psychiatrist, and you can look up mental health, and you can get help. And there are therapists, psychologists, who will actually provide treatment to you uh, on the phone or on Zoom. Um, and you don't even have to get in your car and go somewhere. And that's incredible because, you know, in the old days before we were able to do that, a lot of people who suffered with agoraphobia, it would be very hard for them to get help because they were not willing to actually leave their home to go and see a doctor. Uh, nowadays, it's very possible to do this, and I really want you to get help um, because, you know, it might not be enough to listen to a lecture like this um, if you are already at the point where uh, it is causing you physical symptoms like lack of sleep or panic or whatever else might be. Please seek help. Now, there are two types of help, and this is where I just want to talk briefly about the psychiatrist and the type of help that you can get if you contact a psychiatrist is you can get medical help, right? And a psychiatrist will uh, talk to you and they will evaluate what's going on with you and they can give you a prescription for medication that will have a pretty uh, good response pretty fast. So most of the medications that are given for anxiety are the same medications that are given for depression, which is also interesting, right? It's the same medication treats anxiety as it does uh, uh, depression. And these are medications that are either called SSRIs or S selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Uh, or they are SNRIs, so serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. There are actually now medications that also control dopamine, another neurotransmitter. But essentially what these medications do is that they control your intake of your own neurotransmitters. And neurotransmitters um, are the substance that controls the way that we feel and think and so on, our emotions and um, our feelings in general, okay? So if you are to, in, a, in a place where your anxiety is debilitating, let's say you're having panic attacks, I would recommend that you actually get in touch with a psychiatrist and get on medication because it takes roughly three weeks, two to three weeks, for you to really start feeling a lot better. And when you've done that, then of course it becomes super important to get in touch with a psychologist um, or a social worker or a, uh, an LMFT or someone who is a therapist who can then help you with techniques that are, you know, lifelong. And I love these techniques. Honestly, every time I talk about this particular subject and we're going to get into um, cognitive behavior therapy, which is sort of the primary way that anxiety is treated from a therapy perspective, um, I learn. I rem it reminds me of some of the ways that my mind plays tricks. And these techniques, they're like tools, right? Once you start to talk to a therapist, and the therapist starts to reframe for you the, your thinking, you start to get really good at analyzing your own thoughts. And in every situation that comes up that's causing you anxiety, you will start to recognize, oh, wait a minute, I'm doing that again. I'm doing that mental trick or habit. And that's why I'm starting to feel anxiety. And let me take a deep breath and let me try to control that and let me change my thoughts so that I don't start to get all anxious about it. And that's the key to CBT or cognitive behavior therapy, okay? CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, was developed by a psychiatrist by the name of Aaron Beck, okay? And um, Beck believed that all of our fears or anxieties are a direct consequence of the things that we think, 
So thoughts lead to emotions, and these emotions then can also have uh, physical responses, right? He concluded that if we're able to change our thoughts about a certain thing, that is going to change how we feel about those things. And so as the, and this, believe it or not, as simple as it sounds, it's formed the foundation of, of cognitive behavior therapy, which is our primary way of dealing with anxiety. And it essentially summarize, if I was to summarize it, I'd say, we are influenced more by the things that we perceive, by our beliefs, than by reality itself. So if we can change our thoughts, we can change how we respond to reality. If I change the, the things that I'm thinking, it'll affect how I feel about reality and therefore it'll affect how I behave in the real world, okay? Change your perceptions and you will have different interaction with the world. Now let's talk, let's take some of these examples and apply it to day-to-day uh, -to -day life, right? Imagine that, <clears throat> you know, a common thing that a lot of parents come to me and they tell me, in fact, I think is one of our questions as well, is, you know, I, I'm, I'm worried because I've been doing this type of thing or whatever intervention for 20 years, and I, my child will never get better. That's like one of the primary things that parents, I, whether it's at the diagnostic level where I've first met the family or it's a few years later, the parents will say, I, I'm afraid I'm anxious because my child will never get better, right? And I say, well, can you explain that to me a little bit more detail? And they'll say, well, he's never going to find friends and he's going to be alone for the rest of his life, okay? Now, because of this belief system, any scenario that the, the parent takes their child to, let's say they go to a party or something, they immediately start that scenario comes in their head and they're immediately saying, okay, this is a scenario where I can see that my child is not going to interact with others and again it repeats itself and that means he's never going to get better. So you're, you start to then, like you go to a party, nothing has really happened, but you start to believe, oh my God, my child is not going to interact and he's not going to get better. And you start to actually build yourself up and have uh, increased heart rate. And before you know it, you're having a panic attack when nothing really significant has happened in that particular situation. That might sound familiar to some of you because a lot of times people will tell me these are the things that go on with them. So what happens? Over time, you want to avoid that horrible feeling of anxiety and panic, so you start to avoid those events, right? You start to avoid social situations, and what happens as a result of that? You've now actually brought about the thing that you were afraid of. To begin with, you were afraid that your child would not have the ability to learn to have social uh, relationships and friendships, and you've now made sure of that because you have avoided social situations altogether and now your child doesn't even have the opportunity to learn from those particular situations. So anxiety actually makes us bring about sometimes situations that we are afraid of to begin with. Okay. With cognitive behavior therapy, the therapist asks you to break down your belief system, okay, and evaluate what actually triggered that anxiety to begin with. Where did it come from to begin with, and you know how? Why is why are you maintaining it? Is it really helpful to you in any way? So let's go back to our example of your child uh, never finding friends, right? A, a common belief pattern we have. So let's ask ourselves, what made me believe that this particular thing to begin with? For example, am I catastrophizing? I'm going to talk about that. That's one of the kind of uh, typical mind tricks that we do to ourselves where, where we think a small thing is a catastrophe. I'll come to that. Are we exaggerating negative experiences, minimizing positive things? 
Cognitive behavior therapy helps you identify the very exact kind of mind trick that you're doing to yourself in every scenario, and then it helps you reframe that in a way that you can try to think of it in a more positive way. And if you think of a more positive thing, you will start to feel your anxiety, your feeling of fear just dissipate. Here's, here's one way to kind of get yourself started, okay? The next time that you feel anxiety, sit down, and maybe it's right now, sit down and take out a piece of paper and just start writing as much detail as you can about it, about the scenario. What cause, what is causing this anxiety, right? Be, be specific, like what's, first of all, what is exactly happening? Right? So for who, who did what? When was this? Where did it occur? Write specifically what is the anxiety that you're experiencing. Okay? For example, we went to a party and all the other kids were playing and my child covered his ears and went in, sat in a corner. That is a much better way to explain it than, you know, my child always fails when we go to a party, right? So being specific right now is very important, and in a minute you'll see why. So now you've described this, the scenario that causes you anxiety. Now we want to go back to that moment and ask ourselves, okay, so what thoughts did I have? that triggered this, like what, what were the things in my head? That, you know, I saw my child, he went and sat in the corner, covered his ears, and now what am I thinking when all of this is happening, right? So for example, I could say, um, you know, I thought that my child is unable to handle parties and uh, if he's covering his ears and sitting in the corner, the next thing that's going to happen is he's going to have a massive panic attack and, you know, he's never going to have uh, friends because he's going to have a meltdown and uh, the disaster is upon us, basically. These are all of the thoughts that you would have had, right? Um, once you start doing these exercises, you'll see that the thoughts are, are what are controlling your actual feelings, right? It's not what you saw, but it's what you thought about what you saw that is leading to these, these feelings, okay? So now you have the scenario and you have your thoughts, and now we wanna write down how you feel. What are your feelings about it and how intense are they? Well, uh, you know, uh, you might write, I'm embarrassed, I'm scared, um, I'm almost on the verge of panicking, and it is pretty intense, especially when I uh, go to events like this, right? So you describe your feelings about it. Okay. Now, this is the most important part of this. When you believed that your child would fail, what pattern of, of thinking were you engaged in? What mind trick was your mind playing on you? And, and this is why it becomes so important to learn about these mind tricks. They're actually called cognitive distortions because what they do is they take a real life situation and they distort it. In your mind, we distort the thing that we see and it becomes like this huge catastrophe, for example, or we just don't see the positive things, we see the negative things. Let's talk about these. Let's talk about the, these one by one. And then as we talk about them, let's also think, you know, kind of how can I change this? How can I change the way that I'm thinking about things? Because that's the key to this type of therapy. The, the, having a healthy mindset depends on thinking about things in a positive way and not in an anxiety-provoking way. Okay, so let's talk about these mind tricks or false beliefs or cognitive distortions. The first one is all or none thinking. 
Okay, all or none thinking, this is when we perceive things in extremes. We never think there's a middle ground, like it's all or none. Um, an example of this would be something like, my child didn't interact with the other kids, so he will never learn to interact, right? Notice that the situation was, my child in this particular scenario didn't interact, but the way that we're perceiving it or thinking about it is, oh my God, he's never going to interact. And that thought is what actually causes this tremendous amount of fear, right? So it's, it's not the actual thing that happened, but rather the fear that we had about it, the, the, the thought that we had about it, which led to that fear or anxiety. And if you can try to reframe that thought in that moment, right? You might say something like, he's not interacting right now. He is putting his hands on his ears. Uh, he's sitting in the corner. Oh, I wonder if he is having sound sensitivity. Maybe this place is too loud. Okay. And so that doesn't evoke like a massive amount of fear and anxiety. What it does is it actually First of all, you know, you're being kinder to yourself because you're making sure that you're not having a huge amount of anxiety right away. But secondly, it, it calls you to action. It makes you, it allows you to see the scenario for what it is and actually fix it. So maybe next time I will give him noise canceling headphones or maybe next time when we go to an event, I'm going to practice uh, this with him before, or I won't go to noisy events. First, I'll acclimate my child to events that are less noisy, right? And this is where it's, you start to actually see reality instead of the, that horrible thing, that all or none, right, thinking. And this, another example of this is, is what I referred to before, which is catastrophizing, right? And catastrophizing is actually taking something and, you know, when you see something in all or none, and then taking it all the way to the level of a catastrophe. So, for instance, it would be, you know, my child is sitting in the corner. He's not, he's isolating himself. He's not talking to others. He's never going to learn to socialize. He's going to be all alone. And after I pass away, he's not going to have any friends and oh my god how is he going to survive and it just turns into this devastating ongoing uh, kind of mind trick that is a catastrophe you know I remember um, I mean I we do this all the time not to go back 40 years but I do remember a scenario where I was, um, this was the time when I was taking my licensing exam for psychology. This was back in like the early 1990s. And I um, took my, in those days you had to take a written exam, two written exams, and also an oral examination where you kind of presented. And they asked you, like a whole bunch, a, a, a array of psychologists would sit and ask you a bunch of questions about cases and you had to, on the spot be able to answer them. And I remember there was this one question they asked me, I don't remember the question, and I uh, you know, thought that I had answered it incorrectly. And it's interesting because I came out of the exam and I was a disaster. Like, and let me tell you, you study for months and months for these exams, right? This is the, the end of your doctoral degree and it's very important. And so I was absolutely catastrophizing in my brain. I was all over the place with this. I was like, oh my God, I failed. I did this wrong. I know that I didn't uh, get it right. And, and it was just, I had no control over it, right? Instead of telling myself, you know, I might have messed up on that one question, but I think I did pretty well on everything else, that one question took over, and I honestly couldn't even remember if I did well on everything else. All that was going on, I was ruminating, right? We call it rumination, where you're just like nonstop repeating that disaster in your head, and you're like, oh my God, how am I going to survive? So this, of course, led me to having anxiety, not just just that day, but I ended up having anxiety, honestly, for months, because in those days you got your response in the mail. And so it was months of anxiety, and then of course, 
my results come in the mail. I was about to pass out when I opened the thing, and I, of course I passed. But bottom line is that my mind had done this trick on me where one little episode of getting something wrong had turned into this catastrophe. And it was controlling not just the way I thought, but the way I felt. And it was causing me this incredible distress for months and months. You know, in reality, catastrophes in real life happen very rarely. Right? And they actually happen a lot more frequently in our mind than they do in real life. So the next time that you catch yourself doing this, catastrophizing, just sit back for a minute, take a deep breath, and remind yourself catastrophes really don't happen that often in real life. And what am I doing? Am I catastrophizing? How can I reframe? the way that I'm thinking about this scenario. How can I try to think about it in a kind of middle ground, something that's a li little less of a catastrophe, and then see how you feel about it? Okay. Another cognitive distortion is blaming others. Blaming others is when we hold other people 100% responsible for something that happened, right? So, you know, an example of this is my child is not learning because, and it's the fault of this one teacher. This one teacher is the reason that my child is failing in school. And yeah, let me just add some catastrophizing to it. And uh, let me think also that because of this, my child is going to fail completely and he's never going to be able to finish his academics. Okay? So, a reframe of this, if you catch yourself doing this, is something like, hmm, this is not a good teacher, period. So then, again, action, which is maybe my child would benefit from a, te from a tutor. Or, you know, this is not a big deal because, like, school is almost over. Or my child has also in-home ABA and he's learning from there as well. Or I can go to the school and tell them I don't like this teacher's teaching techniques. Whatever it is, when you start, stop blaming, it makes you realize, oh, it's, a, it's kind of manageable. I can do something about this. And then you take action, right? Because blaming really has no... Uh, positive consequence. Like it just, it, it may make you feel good at that particular instant, but it, it makes us freeze, right? I've blamed, it's so-and-so's fault, it's not in my hands, I can't do anything about it, right? And that's not necessarily where you want to be, and that's something that will cause anxiety because, you know, obviously because you can't do anything about it. Okay, now, the other side is blaming yourself. This is another cognitive distortion, which is super important as well. And self-blame is one of those which I have found to be very common in the parents that I've known over time because they hold themselves responsible for their child's autism. And this is in so many different ways. A parent came to me and crying and said, oh my God, you know, when he was younger, he uh, fell off the table and hit his head. Do you think this is because of that? Or, you know, a doctor will uh, tell you that your child has an allergy, let's say, to casein. And the parents will be like, oh, my God, how did I never see that? And this is my fault. And I maybe the casein is what's causing all of this. And, you know, that blame of ourselves is so debilitating and it causes us to just immediately enter anxiety and depression and it freezes us, right? It causes us to not want to take any kind of action at all and as a result we just start to, you know, just melt down and, and do nothing and become useless to ourselves and to our children. So it is really important that when you start to do that, you, you stop for a minute and you just uh, recognize this pattern of self-blame and say, no, you know, it would have been almost impossible for me to recognize that my child has a casein or a gluten allergy or whatever it is. Um, you know, a, a lot of kids have autism and it's not because they fell and hit their head. You start to realize how unrealistic some of these thoughts were and that there is no good to be done when you blame yourself.
there's just it's because you to freeze and you're not taking action to move forward Another cognitive distortion is called emotional reasoning, right? Emotional reasoning is an interesting one because it is when you accept your emotional response to a situation as validation of the fact that that situation was bad. It's a little complicated. So for instance, when you get angry at something, right? You're angry and instead of thinking through and saying, what's actually causing me this level of anger? What in this scenario? You say, I'm angry and that automatically means that this particular situation is a bad one, right? You, it causes you to label parts of your life as bad. For example, a lot of parents will say, um, I'm always angry at IEPs. Okay, so and that's because they've had a, an experience of a bad IEP, an individualized education plan, you know, the meeting that you have with your school district, and you've had a bad experience and you've been angry, and now you'll start believing that you're always angry at IEPs, and therefore from here on, even if you're going to enter the IEP with the most incredible teachers, the best school there is, you're going to go in with a certain level of anger and anxiety because you've labeled that situation to be an anxiety and anger evoking situation, right? And that type of kind of generalizing your emotions from one instance to all future instances is, can be very harmful to you, right? And because you're always going to be anxious when you're entering a situation that you've labeled as being bad. And so it's important to, to get your mind around that and to realize, okay, I, I need to get control of my thinking. And once you do that, you can get control over your emotions. And I can't tell you it's amazing the relief that you experience when you give up negative, angry thoughts and you seek. Sometimes it's really hard, but you have to like sit there and think, okay, so I'll give you guys an example. I had a kind of a difficult meeting with a group of people yesterday and I was pretty upset. I was, it was something that I was very important to me and I had spent many years of my life working on and uh, it appeared to me that these folks were just not taking it seriously and I was very angry at them, right? And I just left and I was like, I hate these people and I just I can't work with these people. And of course, I sat there and I couldn't reframe it, right? I kept thinking to myself, how do I reframe this? And then this morning, I was able to sit for a minute and think, you know what, actually, one of these people has been very, very nice in the past, and they have actually cared a lot about the things that matter to me. And just thinking of that one person helped me start to realize that maybe the rest of the group are not that bad either. And the whole th thing was relabeled. And I was able to re, you know, reframe it and stop thinking and labeling that situation as bad. And so now going into my next meeting with these folks, I'm not going to be as disturbed. I'm not going to have anxiety about it between now and then. I mean, I can tell you just this morning when I had that kind of uh, feeling, I started to just immediately feel calmer. Okay. Let's uh, keep going. I have about 10 more minutes and I want to make sure I finish these cognitive distortions. They're very important. So the next one is called fortune telling. And fortune telling is when we make these dramatic uh, predictions about the future with very little evidence, right? So for instance, my previous ABA provider was terrible, that's the evidence, so every ABA provider from now on is going to be horrible and it's just going to be a terrible experience for me and for my child and let's add some catastrophe on it and uh, let's go down that rabbit hole and say, okay, so things are going to be awful, he's never going to learn, we're going to fail, we're doomed, 
right? And you can see how these kind of cognitive distortions also interact with each other and they feed on top of each other, right? It's like, you know, I, I blame people uh, because no one really understands what's going on here and uh, ABA providers in general are bad and my teachers are bad and it's a catastrophe and we start to spiral out of control and all of this starts to look like the future is awful and that's when all of the anxiety turns into depression right because of all the things that we're thinking in our heads next time that you start to fortune tell just remind yourself you're not a fortune teller you do not know what is going on what's going to happen in the future how many times have we thought something will happen in the future and the exact opposite did right and another one that's similar to this, another uh, cognitive distortion that's very similar is called mind reading. And mind reading is when we think we know what other people are thinking. And, you know, an example of this for, for pa us as parents is when you go to the supermarket and your child has a tantrum, you immediately think, other people are judging me right now. Other people are thinking I'm a terrible parent because my child is screaming. You don't know that. That is just that that thought of, oh my God, everybody's judging me and they're thinking I'm a terrible parent leads you to a heightened sense of anxiety. Your heart rate goes up and you just hate going to the grocery store. Like a small thing turns into this massive thing because of the way that you're thinking about it. How do you know? Maybe the people that are looking at you are thinking, Oh my God, I remember when my child had a tantrum last week. And good job for this mom for not losing it, right? You don't know what other people are thinking, right? Sometimes you will have those people who are thinking bad things, but it doesn't mean that it is every single time. And you have to reframe yourself and not allow yourself to immediately think of the bad things. It's important to always try to reframe your thoughts and think of the positive things. Maybe these are parents who've had the same exact experience as you, and that empowers you to now take control of the situation, deal with it, and or, or to talk to your uh, treatment provider and say, how do I deal with this situation? It empowers you instead of making you angry and anxious and, you know, uh, frozen, okay? You can replace your thoughts. Okay, two more cognitive distortions. One is called overgeneralization and the other one is called labeling. And overgeneralization involves drawing broad conclusions based on very minimal circumstances or evidence. And we do this all the time, right? I mean, uh, you're, you have one bad experience and then you think from now on, uh, you're going to have this bad experience or you have one bad experience with a person and you can actually overgeneralize that to all people of the same race or all people in the same uh, occupation, right? That is overgeneralization and that's kind of the key to this whole thing of cognitive distortions because it shows you how quickly we take one scenario and produce this whole set of thinking around it that isn't really correct. Labeling is the same thing. We place negative labels on people based on a very small occurrence, right? Um, like, you know, something happened and this teacher called my child out. So this is a terrible person. No, maybe the teacher is actually a really good teacher. And the reason they called your child out is because they want to teach your child. They're trying to do something positive about it. There is always a way to reframe the thoughts. Even in the worst of circumstances, believe me, there is a way that you can reframe the thinking to find the positive that exists there. And now we're on to, we're almost finished, we're on to two other distortions that are kind of two, two sides of the same coin, which are magnifying the negative and minimizing the positive. And now remember, we do this all day long, all the time, like, and this is part of the whole catastrophizing thing as well, right? Negative thoughts that are things like dwelling on our fears or on our losses, 
or on things that are irritating, right? Notice how much of the day you think about things that are anxiety provoking, as opposed to thinking about things that are calming and soothing. Like for instance, how blessed we are that we actually woke up this morning and took a deep breath and we're healthy. Or how blessed we are that our children are in good programs. Or how blessed we are that we live in the United States where we have health insurance coverage for treatment of disabilities for our children. We don't think about, we don't uh, you know, dwell on those. We de- dwell on negative things. And as a result, those negative things become bigger. And again, those thoughts produce anxiety and all these horrible feelings that then produce illnesses for us physically as well. So it becomes really, really important to try to remind yourself. I mean, this is someone taught me a trick where when you wake up in the morning, the very first thing you should think of is what are you grateful for? That's all. Just go for one, you know, thank uh, the Lord or the universe or whatever you believe in and just say, this is what I'm grateful for. Just one thing every day. And believe me, it changes your entire perspective because that kind of stays in your mind and helps you to not only see the negative, okay? One of my favorites, uh, which I I had a mentor when I was doing my postdoctoral mentorship uh, 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 training, and he always would, this is called should statements. He he, uh, used to call it, uh, the house of shoulds, because, you know, he would point out to me how many times in sentences I would say something like, oh my God, I should have done that, I should have done this, and or he should have done that, she should have done this. And that whole thing about the house of shoulds is a very interesting thing. It's like, you know, why are there a series of rules that we must adhere to. And if we don't adhere to those rules, then it's devastation and failure, right? That's another cognitive distortion, which is kind of controlling the way we think and the way we feel. You know, honestly, it's just, there is no such thing as should, right? Because the way we feel is the way we feel. It doesn't matter. And the thing I wanna say about feelings, a lot of times when we feel sad, that in itself scares us. Don't be scared about feeling sad. Feelings are transient, they come and go. Thoughts also come and go, but if you, but you have to exercise control over them, okay? Because if you don't, then those thoughts become 90% of your day and they result in those negative feelings that become 90% of your day. And before you know it, You don't have control over the other 10% anymore. And then that anxiety kind of takes yourself, takes over life, right? Anxiety and depression. So it's really, really important that you try to remind yourself when you're doing these types of things, when you're having a negative experience, when your heart rate starts to go up, when you feel like you can't breathe, just remind yourself, just sit for a minute and say, okay, what was that exercise? I'm gonna write down what is going on right now. I'm gonna write down what I think about it. And then I'm going to write down what I feel about it. And then I'm gonna try to figure out which of the cognitive distortions is, is playing a trick on me right now. What am I doing? Am I minimizing the positive? Am I having all or none thinking? Am I doing a should statement? Am I blaming myself? What am I doing? And how can I reframe the current thoughts in a very positive way? Can I convince myself to think of a positive thing instead of that rumination of the negative? What can I do? Change your thoughts. And if you change your thoughts, will that change the way you feel? Will it change the way you see life? Will it allow you to now take action and do things differently? I promise you it will. I promise you it will. It's extremely, extremely important to do these exercises. You know, I wanted to end, and I think I have just less than a a, a minute, but I wanted to end with, I know many of you as parents of children with disabilities may have already heard of of this, uh, the beautiful, beautiful, 
uh, writing by uh, Emily Pearl Kingsley, which is called Welcome to Holland. And the reason I want to end with this is that it is the most incredible way of reframing a negative experience or a negative thought. And here's how it goes. When you're going to have a baby, it's like planning a fabulous vacation trip to Italy. You buy a bunch of guidebooks and make your wonderful plans. You're going to go to the Colosseum. I'm going to uh, see the Michelangelo, David, the gondolas in Venice. You might learn some handy phrases in Italian. It's extremely exciting. After months of eager anticipation, the day finally arrives. You pack your bags and off you go. Several hours later, the plane lands. The stewardess comes in and says, welcome to Holland. Holland, you say? What do you mean Holland? I signed up for Italy. I'm supposed to be in Italy. All my life, I've dreamed of going to Italy. But there's been a change in the flight plan. They've landed in Holland, and there you must stay. The important thing is that they haven't taken you to a horrible, disgusting, filthy place full of pestilence, famine, and disease. It's, just, it's a different place, right? This is where you're reframing. You could have said, Holland, Holland is awful, but it isn't. You're now going to reframe. So you must go out and buy new guidebooks. You must learn a whole new language. And you will meet a whole new group of people you would never have met. It's just a different place. It's slower paced than Italy, less flashy than Italy. But after you've been there for a while and you catch your breath, you look around and you begin to notice that Holland has windmills. Holland has tulips. Holland even has Rembrandts. But everyone you know is busy coming and going from Italy. And for the rest of your life, you'll say, yeah, that's where I was supposed to go. That's what I had planned. But if you spend your life mourning the fact that you didn't go to Italy, you may never be free to enjoy the very special, the very lovely things about Holland. So that, I hope, helps you a little bit. I know that it's not easy and that sometimes when we're in a state of anxiety, it's almost impossible to control. But I hope those techniques help you a little bit. Understanding anxiety better and controlling your thoughts will control your feelings. Thank you so much, everyone. I will see you next time. If you found anything helpful in this video, please give us a like. In fact, make sure that you smash that subscribe button on YouTube and give us a like on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Instagram for important updates. And please download our free podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much. See you next time.